want Jean's jacket and James Dean's car It is hair and Carl's guitar Today we'll be interviewing the great Daryl Seguenza. He toured with Aerosmith and ZZ Top. I'll just say a couple words about my brother Daryl Seguenza. I didn't know much about him when TKO came out. It's only great music because you got a great rhythm section and when you got a guy like Daryl holding down the drums, you got a great rhythm section. No matter who's playing bass, you don't even need a bass player if you don't want because you got Daryl Seguenza. Here's to you bro. Thanks for everything man. What a great freaking person you are and you're not a bad drummer either. Well I'll be darned if it ain't Daryl Seguenza. Come on in. Hey Barry. Good to see you Daryl. <laughs> All right. Hey Sonny out. We're here today with our good friend Daryl Seguenza. Now Daryl has quite a history in the Northwest. He's sung and played drums with some of some of the great Seattle bands, Mojo Hand, <laughs> TKO, and there's another one that he played in, but we'll get to that later. We'll have a little conversation. Daryl? Hi, Barry. Welcome. Thank you. Well, I actually started when I was 13 years old. I started playing drums, and I learned how to play by stacking my sister's 45s on the turntable and played to every pop song there was of the day. Most of it was girl groups and soul music and all the, and then, then later in, you know, in the 60s it was the Beatles and all the British Invasion stuff. We were like 15, 16 years old. We used to go to this jazz club on the East Lake Avenue, it was called the Longerland. And we could get in because it was a coffee house. Listen to all these great jazz musicians. He's he's the guy who shows up. And we did the we did the fiesta for years without a drummer. And then one year Daryl brought his gear down and set up. And it made all the difference in the world. Okay? Just, and we asked him if we could play there and he said, What kind of music do you do? So it just immediately came out of our mouths, we play jazz rock. And then no, that that term hadn't even existed. Right around the corner from that was the Helix magazine office. That was the underground magazine for the hippies back in the day. And uh, Paul Dorpat, who was the editor of that, actually heard us play there. And because of that, we started playing all of the beans in the park. And we Auditorium, and here we are in high school. And we're playing all these shows, opening up for you know, you know, like the Grateful Dead and Santana and all these, just all these bands of the '60s, you know, and that were coming to Seattle. All the, all the great groups, and that, that's how it started for me in Seattle. Or so, I would be personally introduced to the drummer of TKO, Daryl Sequenza, and he would become a buddy of mine like this. Whenever we do a Fiesta del Jefe, he's the designated drummer. And it really kind of snowballed from there. That was really my, you know, it was a great uh, break for me as far as the music goes. Hold Your Hand started in a in a tiny little bar. On it was at the time it was the it was the Skid Row of Ballard. It was Ballard Avenue, which is now a big, you know, big yuppie right. strip where all the restaurants and all the high price restaurants and bars are now. But back then it was it was you know it was really low class, low key. A lot of bar there, and they called it the El Roach, and they needed a band. They said, let's put a band together, and we went there. We just started jamming. That's how it started for us. We didn't even have a name yet. We had all kinds of stupid names. I don't even want to say it. Yet. What are some of the other names that you had for Mojo Hand <laughs> that you don't want to mention? No, uh, <laughs> you got to give us one or two. Oh, oh, okay. I'll give you the the worst one. Pussy. 
I did it as a joke because we put up a sign and said, "Come on in, free pussy oh, tonight." No. It was stupid. I played there for God, I don't know, six months or so, and one night this guy comes in the bar. His, his name is Al. It's a hippie bar. It's a biker bar, really. Um, and he comes in. He sit. You can. He really sticks out because he's sitting at the bar and he's got real short hair, and uh, looks like a businessman. He listens to us the whole night, and after the night, he goes. I had this bar in Pioneer Square. Would you guys want to play there? And of course we want to play there. We've never played anywhere else. So we go down to this bar and it's the great one. And we just rock Pioneer Square. I mean, all of a sudden, within a couple of months, we just became this huge hit. Everybody, we're playing all the great concerts and all these shows and opening acts for everybody. Miles, buddy Miles came into the bar one night with this with this groupie that I knew. And uh, yeah, she brought him in. He was playing with Hendrix that night. He came in, sat in with us, um, took Michael's guitar, turned it around, played it left-handed just like Hendrix. It was always crowded every night of the week. My mom and dad had never seen me play in a, in a rock band before. The mayor of Seattle and his entourage were there. And they used to come in and see us all the time. My mom never got over that. Oh my God, you know, the mayor was there to see my son. And we started playing all the rock festivals. You know, uh, the Buffalo Party Convention, the Sky River. Who was in the band besides you and Joe Joanne? Okay, so on guitar was a guy named Perry Guitar Johnson. And then uh, Michael Silversmith was the lead singer, um, another guitar player, and Mark Seidenberg was on bass. In fact, Mark Seidenberg and I became this group called TKO. We were the rhythm section on the first album and toured with the band for two years. I'm aware of TKO, and that's a nice segue into that band. <laughs> and that was kind. I had been coming through my Rolling Stone magazines and found that big ad that had your your picture on there. We were pretty impressed and thought it was pretty fun and gave it to you. And yeah, that was really, I had, didn't, I didn't even know that existed when you gave that to me for my birthday present. Yeah. I was just a shock. I was Boy, like, you, you, a shock for you, I'm thumbing through an old Rolling Stone. There's Daryl. You know? <laughs> um, what about TKO? Who was in that band? Uh, there was three other members besides Mark and I. There was uh, Brad Sinsel, who was the lead singer. Uh, Rick Pierce, who's still playing with, um, I think he plays with Q5. Uh, and they, they're still playing. They play in Europe a lot. And the other guitar player was a guy named Tony Bortko, who, who uh, died many years ago. Yeah, I get the local promo albums. Or Anyway, I took home this TKO album one time, and I, I, I said, well, who are these guys? It's a local band. Well, the shit they're playing is a little heavy for my taste, but it's good. I like it. How did, uh, now you had a record deal with TKO. Yeah, we had a record deal. We were signed with CBS Infinity Record. And Infinity, there was a guy named Ron Luxembourg. Um, he was the president of that, and they gave him carte blanche with that label because he had all these successes before that. All these groups he had signed. Hmm. That label lasted a long time until he signed the Pope. What? He actually did a record with the Pope. But anyway, that record was a big flop. And that label went under. Um, so you guys were signed by a major label. Uh, yeah. You know, we got our manager to get that tape in front of the right people. And so I remember when he flew out to New York and he met with Ron Alexander. Ron said, I like this band. I want to come see them, see them live. He had brought with him a, a film that we had made, that we had filmed down at the Paramount, of us on stage doing our songs, synced them all up, and did parts of them. So it was a medley of songs, of the songs that we had written. And so he came out, we had a show that we did at K. Smith Studios. K. Smith had this really big sound stage, and we rented that, and we invited everybody we knew, and we you know, got the place packed, brought the guy in there, he heard us, and we got signed that night. Wow. Right after the show, he signed us. You know, I, I gotta say, you know, getting signed by a major label, I can remember it so well, because my whole life I had really wanted to be signed, yeah. and I wanted to get a record deal. I spent a lot of years in the basement, you know, with guys trying to do that, making demo tapes. That happened, I was more like, oh, now the work really begins.
That's exactly how I felt, and I can still remember it to this day. Were you right? I was absolutely right, and um, you know, and as rock and roll bands go, um, that's exactly what happened. We, you know, we got sent out on the road, and our first tour was with the Kinks, opening for them, doing colleges. I think the last show I did with them is was the Texas Jam, and we were the opening act with uh, nine other huge acts like Boston, and Errol Smith, Van Halen, Hart, other bands, and there was 80,000 people there. You know, that was a hell of a show. That was my last show with TKO. What a, what a way to go out. Yeah, well. <laughs> I live vicariously through you. Tell me, what was it like, like that lifestyle for you? Honestly, it was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah? And, you know, a lot of it was tedious. You're on the road, you're traveling. We would play, literally, because we're an opening act, we would play no longer than 45 minutes a night. Most of the time it was a half hour. And a lot of times you never got a sound check. And a lot of times they turned only on, they turned on only half of the PA because the next band wanted to sound big. So you get on, you play a half hour and 45 minutes, you get back on the bus and you travel eight hours. 10 hours at the most every single night and then you you're, so you're driving all night you get you know it's it's you probably heard this story a million times but you get there and and then you get your hotel and then uh, you wait around all day so there's a lot of waiting there's a lot of waiting going on and then you finally get to do your thing so yeah but it was fun I mean there's no doubt I mean I can't tell you how many times I was just sitting backstage looking out at what's going on in the audience and going I can't even believe I'm here so I can't believe so what you're saying too is much fun. You, were, you were treated as a spoiled, pampered rock star. <laughs> you, could, you could do anything you wanted and you could summon anyone to your room at any time and <laughs> eat and drink what you wanted and call all of the shots. I think you're thinking of Van Halen. Oh. But, <laughs> no, it, there's, you know, even even at our level there was, a, there was some of that going on. We, you get a lot of things done for you when you're when you're when you're in a, in a rock band, and you have because you have roadies, you have man, you have you know all these people doing things for you. So there's not a whole lot you have to do other than think think about what you're going to do on stage and practice and all that. As it should be. And and, and you know so it's a great thing and it's uh, you know that's one of the things you miss later on in life, especially now you're still playing and you don't have roadies anymore. And I always tell people now. You don't pay me to to play. You pay me to move my equipment. Travel to the gig and, and to stay up late at night. <laughs> <laughs> All of that. And to travel to the gig and, and to stay up late at night. <laughs> yeah, was. Uh, who, now you mentioned the manager. Who was the manager? Ken Kinnear, and he was also the manager of Heart. One time we were. This is a. This is the shortest limousine ride in the history of the world. We were in upstate New York on the Kinks tour. We we're playing these really small colleges, you know, 1,500 seats. This particular college we played at that night, I think it was in Ithaca, New York. But there was no uh, dressing rooms in the back of the stage like they're normally in. So you had to go outside a door, come back in, and go in another door. Anyway, so, but at the time we're playing with them, it's like literally 10 degrees below zero. And what we were on stage is pretty flimsy, you know, back in those days. It was, you know, satin pants and, you know, all the rock star kind of stuff. Were boxers or, brief, or briefs? Which did you have? <laughs> None. Commando? Commando, baby. Nice. That was real rock and roll. That's rock and roll. <laughs> Come here, you got to show it all. <laughs> I wouldn't do that today, but, you know. <laughs> Outside, we would, I guess we would have, they thought we would have froze to death. So what they did is they had a limo sitting outside that door, running, with the heat on. And so, it's time to go on. They open the door, we jump in the limo, they shut the door, the limo literally drives two feet to the next door, the door opens, the other backstage door opens, we run in and we go on stage. <laughs> the shortest limo ride in rock and roll history.
And I guarantee you that is it. I bet nobody else has that story. Nobody else has that story. Well, okay, my, you know, my family was not an entertainment family, except for my oldest sister. My oldest sister, and we, her, her stage name was Hula, she was a showgirl in Las Vegas. Yeah. She was a showgirl back in the day when the gangsters ran in Vegas. And she worked in a, in a Stardust Hotel. Um, besides Louis Prima, she, their act was the second most popular act on the strip. Ronnie Kelly's Polynesian Review. <laughs> so my dad, my dad went to Vegas too, and he ran this Hair in Nevada Country Club. And all the stars used to go there, so he knew everybody and at the club. And Jerry Lewis was there chasing my dad in the kitchen like a butcher knife. <laughs> and my dad's running around the kitchen laughing. And Jerry Lewis is chasing him with his butcher knife and telling him, I don't know, he was saying something. I don't even remember what it was, but he said, I'm going to kill him. It was funny. So Don Rickles, um, people don't know this about him, but him and his, his wife were the nicest people you'd ever want to meet. I mean, they were so sweet to you. If you did anything for them, you got a present, you know, a card in the mail. It was amazing how they treated people. And that's how they were. They had that reputation. And it was out. The notable musicians or the guys that you respect, that you've played in bands with throughout the year, tell me about some of those people, if you will. Oh, okay. The first one that comes to mind, Barry Curtis from the Kingsman. Him and I did a band. We've done bands together, more than one. Uh, uh, and all the guys from Junior Cadillac, um, Freddie know, Dennis, you know, uh, another guy in the Northwest. Dick Powell. I don't know if you know who Dick I Powell do. is. Dick Powell, I played with him. I played with John Lee Hooker. I, I played with, um, with uh, Chuck Berry once. Got to do that, you know, and fortunately I didn't get kicked off the stage. <laughs> yeah. or any of that. Well, you were the drummer. I was the drummer, but I knew his stuff, and I knew better than to get in the way. Right. <laughs> um, and um, yourself? Um, God. One that I know you played with that I want to bring up, and that was Max Paul Schwenson. Oh, actually, Max Schwenson, yeah. Max was great. Max played with um, Doug Kershaw yeah. for years, and Max was a great singer songwriter. And him and I and, uh, and Stan Ike and Bernie Lacombe did, had a band for years and, until Max passed. The immediate thing we had immediately was we had three-part harmony, and it was instantaneous. You have a son. I have a son. My son is Damon. His name is Damon, and I have uh, three grandkids. Are now girls, boys? What They're all boys. They're all boys. One of your sister. Oh, was that your birthday party? I sh she didn't know who I was. Maria, me. probably. I thought it was pretty cute. She yeah. thought you were the cat's, my, cat's meow. <clears throat> I know. But thank you. Thanks for that. I mean, my sister, she's she's a sweetie. And Maria. She, she was actually the one that really turned me on to music. She used to take me to all the all the concerts she'd go to when I was a little boy. She would, I saw James Brown no. in his prime. No kidding. Yeah, it was amazing. Amazing stuff back in those days. I'd sit there next to the, to the band and watch the drummer the whole night. That's all I did. And I had the best time doing that. That was how I learned how to play. That was another way I learned, was watching all these great soul drummers, you know, in these, these after hours clubs. I love, I love support, playing support on drums, but I mainly love to sing with people. I love harmony. I'd rather, I would sing harmony all night long if I could. All the difference in the world, okay? It just, everything sounded different. People kept coming up to me later saying, holy cow, man, having that drummer there, that, who's, what's his name? I got Daryl. I says, yeah, having Daryl there, that made all the difference in the world. Plus, he really has a great voice, which he does. Guy sings. I've been away from you for so long. Still, every time I think of us, I get blue, but all I can do is dream you. I was feeling so bad. I asked my family doctor just what I had. Give me a ticket for an airplane. I ain't got time to take no fast train. All the long days are gone I'm coming home Well, my baby she wrote me a letter You had a band 
one you named Cat's Meow. Yep. Triple door party that you and you assembled the band and some of the best players. How was that experience for you? It was it was a lot of fun. Um, first of all, um, I got a, you know I was getting a lot of corporate gigs. That was one of them, and um, I had two versions of Cat's Meow. I had the five piece version and I had the ten piece version. And I heard Layla, and it just knocked me out. Yeah, we we used to do that too. That was a great song. We had we had a. The funny thing about that band is we never had one rehearsal ever. I, we started playing and we knew so many songs. We had hundreds of them. Sounded and it was amazing. Uh, fun, fun band to play with, you know. But we added four horn players, mm -hmm. and Les Klinkenbeard from Cadillac was part of that horn section. So was Jeffrey Beals. Yeah. Um, the Kinks were typical English guys that drank too much so a lot of times. They would drink a lot. I'm not saying Ray Davies especially, but the rest of the guys in the band were kind of over-the-top drinkers. And they used to horse around on the stage a lot. And one time, they, uh, this is a two-part story. Time they were horsing around this, on the stage after all the equipment had been set up, so the, our equipment was in front of theirs and their equipment's behind us. And they were up there goofing around, and anyway, one of them knocks over a guitar and breaks it. Back in the day when there was these Kramer guitars, that guy was uh, on tour with us with the Kinks. He was, they were doing testing for him. So I brought him in advance and took out a guitar. That was a good story. This other story is kind of, is kind of one of those funny stories about drinking. drank so much that a lot of them couldn't hold their water. In fact, the bass player couldn't hold their water, his water at all. And during the course of his two-hour set, <laughs> he had to pee a lot. So they had Marshall Lamp stacks, Marshall stacks on stage, and you know, double stack. And during the, during, literally during the show, he would walk behind like this with his guitar, walk around behind his, his Marshall stack, and right there was a big bucket, and he would just hang it out and pee while he's playing. When he's done, zip it up, walk back out. <laughs> and like nothing happened. So, the show must go on. The show must go on. It was funny though. We still laugh at him. You know, you know, throughout my career since high school, I got to open for so many great acts. I mean, back in the 60s, it was all the San Francisco bands. And you know everybody from the Jefferson Airplane, on you know on down really. Well, my mentor, I call him my mentor because he really literally was, even though he may say he did nothing. It was the father of my my keyboard player in high school. His name was Ernie Hatfield Sr. My friend was named Ernie Hatfield. They were both. His dad was used to be the singer. Used to be one of the singers in uh, Ella Fitzgerald's band, and. Uh, and also play piano for her. Well, um, I'd go over to their house. My, my, my friend Ernie Jr. had his Hammond B3 set up in the living room. His dad had his piano over here. And I had a set of drums that were always set up there. It was just always there. And so when I'd come over after high school, you know, after school, we'd spend, I'd go there just about five, six nights a week. And we'd play music. And Mr. Hatfield had this book, you know, this thick, of every song he knew in decades, and it was extensive. Yeah. And so I would flip through the book and just choose songs to play, and I'd go, let's play that song. And when I first started doing it, you know, I was, of course, had no idea what it was going to be. It never did, really. But he would just tell me things like, just listen, less is more, things like that, you know. Silence is also music, you know, this kind of stuff. That never made any sense to me back then, but today it does. You know, you know, being able to play what's necessary and not, and leave out what's not. Well, from your your comments and your tone about this man, it sounds like obviously you really respected him. I, oh, absolutely. I, I felt I feel a little bit that you really uh, were endeared to him. Absolutely, I had dinner with that family every you know many nights a week. You know, they were really good to me, um, and so I really learned a lot from him. And because of that. I was able to, later on in years, 
without any experience, I'd get up, I'd get hired to go do, to go back somebody like Johnny Guitar Watson, um, for example, at Encore Ballroom. You know, I was 17 years old. They'd ask me to play drums with him. I'd never played with him before. I had no idea what he was going to do, and I went in there and did it. able to do it because of Mr. Hatfield. I was just thinking, I could hear him in my ear going, just listen. Don't worry about it, just listen. Because I, you, you don't have to know the song, just listen to it. It'll come to you, you'll just figure it out. And it just did. For sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Even I, though you didn't want me to. <laughs> she, was, uh, she was our first star in our family, yeah. as far as that goes. And everybody knew her. I could get a ticket to any event, any show I wanted to see in Vegas. Never paid for it. It was always comped because of my sister. And later, my dad, who my dad actually, he moved to Vegas and he started. He was a, he's been a chef all his life. <laughs> I know. Sad story, huh? No, that's uh. <laughs> That's the next. Uh, in the next. In <laughs> you want to? I want in now. <laughs> I know you've played with one of our close friends, oldest, one of the oldest guitar picking friends that we have around here is Rod Cook. You played with him? Not, not really. I, I you know, I played. Don't embarrass me. Okay. Tell us about your okay, experiences. Okay, let me lie. No, no, I played with Ron, uh, Rob, Rod, Rod. Rod, good for, you're good. You're good. <laughs> Rod, you're good friend. <laughs> well, that's why I see what happens when you get try to get people to lie. Maybe you should tell me who you play. No, I didn't. I've never. I I jam with Rod, but he's never really played fast. So yeah, that's good old Rob. Good old whatever his name is. <laughs> uh, no offense, my friend, because you're a great guitar player. And world I love class, you. I love world class. Uh, they uh, knocked me out at 13 years old or whatever I was. Sure, you were 20 then. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. um, it's that one down here. We'll start there. Start. There you go. Gypsy woman told my mother who I was born. You got a boy child coming. Gonna be a son of a gun. Gonna make no no changes. It just stays on the one. Okay. Are you filming? Yeah, you liar. You're a liar. I can see it in your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> 